Gospel of Mark, uh, chapter 10, verses 46 through 52. Here we find an incident that happened just a few days before Jesus was crucified, maybe a week before. And he was on his final journey to Jerusalem. And before people would gather and sing Hosanna, this was the final triumphal entry. And he, after this incident, he gave instructions to the disciples to go find a colt or a donkey. And uh, right before that, this particular incident took place. And so Mark juxtaposes this right before the triumphal entry, which begins in chapter 11. And of course, when the gospel were written and the Bible was originally written, there was no chapter divisions. So it was written like one long letter. So when chapter divisions came, you know, just hundreds of years later. And so when this was read, and basically the gospel of Mark is nothing but the sermons of Peter. And Peter was a close disciple of Jesus. And then later on we find Mark traveled with Peter, recorded the sermons of Peter, and it was the first gospel to be written. So there was an excitement when this gospel was read in all the churches to all the believers. And here we find the first-hand witness and the report is being read, what Jesus did and how things progressed. So it was one long letter that was read and people were eagerly listening. And the one who was reading didn't say, okay, we are reading chapter 11. Now let's close in verse 52 of chapter 10 and then take a break and go to 11. But they were all eagerly listening to the word of the Lord. And this was the first hand report of Peter sharing and Mark recording and it is being read, the first gospel to be written. So I want you to understand the context in which this was written. And right after this is where we read about how Jesus gets into Jerusalem and how people shout Hosanna. And, but this incident happened right before that. And we read here the story of how Jesus healed a blind man. And incidentally, the blind man's name is mentioned. Many times we find Jesus healed so many people, the gospel writers did not record all the names, but few names have been recorded in various places. Lazarus' name is recorded when Jesus, whom Jesus raised from the dead. And we find in the gospel, uh, gospels, uh, four different times we find uh, it is recorded that Jesus healed blind people and opened their eyes. And uh, all the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, talks about Jesus opening blind eyes. But this incident is mentioned in three gospels. But only Mark mentions the name of the person whose eyes was opened. And uh, this is the first gospel. So let's stand and read this and uh, read it with excitement and read it as though you're listening and hearing this for the first time as the gospel was uh, uh, being read. Okay, let's read it together. It's on the screen. Out loud together. Then they came to Jericho as Jesus and his disciples together with a large crowd were leaving the city. A blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called to the blind man, cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, 
Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. You may be seated. Mark tells us this happened as he was approaching Jericho. Matthew tells in a different way, he says it happened as he was leaving Jericho. Because different people have different perspectives. There were two Jerichos. One was the old Jericho and one was the new Jericho. Just like many cities have an old city, an old Delhi, new Delhi. You have old Hyderabad and new Hyderabad and many places have all these new cities that have emerged. You have old Bombay and you have Navi Bombay or new Bombay. So also Jericho had two Jerichos. One that was old Jericho that would date back to the time of Joshua. You remember the story how Joshua uh, had to come and conquer Jericho. It was a highly fortified city. The walls were massive for horses and chariots to ply through the top of those walls. And how God did a miracle without doing anything, just marching around and praising God silently. And finally, they shouted praises to the Lord. The walls of Jericho fell down. And then we find uh, Joshua in chapter 6, verse 17 of Joshua, pronounced a curse upon Jericho. And you know the story of what happened and uh, how uh, God had told Joshua that mm, you should not do anything, but you should basically destroy the whole city because it was filled with so much of heathen practices. And Joshua pronounced a curse upon that city. And the curse was that anybody that would rebuild that city uh, would be uh, destroyed and that city would never be rebuilt. And if they tried to rebuild, it would be at a cost. And if you read First Kings, Chapter uh, 16, verse 34, we find during the time of Ahab, after Joshua's time, during the time of Ahab, this Jericho city was rebuilt by a man called Hail of Bethel, rebuilt Jericho. He laid its foundations at the cost of his firstborn son, Abiram, and he set up its gates at the cost of his youngest son, Segub, in accordance with the word of the Lord spoken by Joshua, son of Nun. Anybody that tried to rebuild the city came under a curse. And here we find this man who tried to rebuild that city. What happened? He lost his uh, first son and he lost another son. And then we find later on, during the time of Jesus, around that time, we find Herod the Great tried to build a new Jericho, and it became his winter resort. Jericho was like Palm Springs. It had a lot of palm trees. So a lot of people would go to Jericho and spend time during the winter. It was only 17 miles uh, northeast of Jerusalem. And, and there are a lot of stories connected with Jericho that you find in the New Testament. Zacchaeus was from Jericho. And uh, we find how Jesus uh, transformed that curse. And wherever Jesus comes, uh, he, will, he can uh, take that curse and make it into a blessing. And that is what we have in the Gospels, and that is what happens when we come to Jesus Christ. All of us were under a curse, but when we put our trust in Jesus Christ, he removed the curse, and he took the curse upon himself and liberated us and delivered us out of darkness. And so we find the grace of God uh, working in Jericho. And this man, his name is Bartimaeus, and we find he's referred to as a son of Timaeus, and Timaeus means an honorable person. He was probably a very well-known, influential, rich person, but his son was blind. And being blind in those days, didn't have uh, the facilities that blind people have today. Uh, all that they could do was beg. And here is a son of a, maybe an influential, educated, rich person in, in that town, but he was blind and he was begging. 
a person with that handicap. And there are a lot of blind people in the world. Uh, according to World Health Organization, as of 2010, there were 285 blind people, visually impaired people in the world. And the largest number of blind people in the world are in India. More than 20% of all the blind people in the world are in India. They say 39 million people as of 2010 are totally blind in the world, of which more than 16 million of them are in India. And I'm sure all of us have seen blind beggars in India, and all of us have given alms to blind beggars in India. And just like what happens in a, uh, uh, in a poor situation, whether it's a slum of a city or in a village, Blind people have no other recourse but to beg. And in, in, in this country, of course, blind people have access. And of course, now there are Braille schools in India, and they can read, and they can do a lot of things. Uh, I had a, 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 a blind friend here in the US, and I had a friend in Delhi who was a professor. And uh, we were together for two months. And uh, if we didn't see each other after two, three days, he would say, Carlson, I didn't see you for two, three days. And he's totally blind. And so, you know, they were very sensitive. And the moment uh, they, you walked in, they knew you walked in. When I was young, I learned violin for eight years. And my uh, violin teacher was totally blind. And he would sit right next to me diagonally. And if I did not play it properly, he would slap on my uh, knee and he knew exactly what I was doing. You know, there's an extra sensitivity for blind people. They are very sharp in terms of hearing and, uh, you know, have that special gift that uh, is, is given to them. And so you know how blind people operate. And here's a person, maybe came from a quite well-to-do family because his father's name was Honorable. Timaeus means honorable. And he was a son of an honorable person. What is he doing? He's sitting along the street begging. And all of a sudden, he hears a lot of commotion. And he finds out that Jesus is passing by. And then he had heard that Jesus is has done a lot of miracles, and he's a miracle worker. And wherever he has gone, he has opened blind eyes, and he has opened uh, deaf ears, made the lame to walk, and raised uh, people from the dead. And he thought, this is his opportunity. And so what does he do? He starts screaming, actually. The word that is used there is a very strong word. He starts shouting, crying out loud. And he says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And then what do people do? Verse 48, many rebuked him and told him to be quiet. And he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Here is a person, son of a very honorable person, maybe influential, wealthy individual, but he's begging. And then he says, I don't care about my position. I don't care whose son I am. I know I want to receive sight, and this is my golden opportunity. And he began to seize that opportunity. God gives to each person an opportunity. And God gives to us a chance for us to be touched, made whole by the Lord. And you know this is our time for us to draw close to the Lord. And he probably did not know, but intuitively he, he knew that if he didn't seize this opportunity, he may never get another chance for Jesus to touch him and heal him. So he shouts, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And he probably heard how others addressed him. He probably heard about the miracles that Jesus performed. And uh, he said, I'm going to... Get the attention of Jesus somehow and make sure that I receive my sight. Now notice, prior to that, what was he doing? He was sitting and begging. And his attention was on people. And when there is a crowd, of course, the expectations of beggars rise. More people, more donations, isn't it? More people, more money. And now what does he do? His attention is not on people. He said, I don't care about money. I've been begging for a long time. Now I want help from Jesus. People may give donations. People may give money. But they cannot give me sight. 
Only Christ can give me sight. So he screams, he shouts, and he wants to cast the attention of Jesus. And he says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Seizing the opportunity that God gives. There is a spiritual opportunity that he gives to all of us. There is a salvation opportunity that he gives to us, but there is also spiritual opportunities that he gives to us. And if we don't seize those opportunities, we lose those opportunities. A lot of times we continue on a spiritually barren state. We miss out on blessings because we don't seize the opportunities that God gives to us. We become indifferent, we become negligent, and we think, oh, maybe another time will come. But very seldom do God give us many opportunities. Yes, he's a God of second chances. But sometimes he gives us opportunities. If we don't use those opportunities, that opportunities pass us. And God will grant that opportunity to somebody else. I'm sure I've shared this uh, in a different context here. In Greece, there was a statue. A man made a statue. In that statue, this man had a lot of hair in the front, locks of hair in the front, like a Sardarji would have hair. It had it on the forehead. And this statue had wings on his feet. And then in the back of the head of this man, he was completely bald. And there was an inscription on that statue, and it said, my name is Opportunity. So people gather around and ask this man, what does this mean? Why is it said, my name is Opportunity? The man's feet is wings, he has hair on the forehead, and completely bald in the back. So the person who um, carved the statue said, time is like this, it comes and gives you an opportunity from the fret. You have to seize time when it comes towards you. And time has wings, it flies away, it waits for no man. And once it is gone, you cannot grab time from behind because it's completely bald. My name is opportunity. God gives to all of us opportunities. And when he gives you opportunity, you need to seize it from the front. Because it flies away. And once it's gone, it's gone. This man knew if he didn't catch the attention of Jesus, he would not have another opportunity. And by the way, this was the final journey of Jesus to Jerusalem. And he was going to be crucified. I'm sure Bartimaeus did not know that, but intuitively he knew this was his time and I need to seize the opportunity. The second thing that I want to um, draw your attention from this passage is people rebuked him. Be quiet, be decent. You come from a decent family. Think of your father. Your father's name means honorable. You know, act and uh, behave yourself. Be quiet. There are a lot of people around. He says, I don't care. I don't care. And I'm not focused on people. I'm tired of begging. I'm tired of begging and receiving little donations from people. And those donations are not going to sustain me. What I need is sight. And I know only Christ can give me sight. So often... Our focus sometimes is on people, not on Christ, not on Christ. And we are there with a begging bowl. And all that we want is a little money, a little wealth. And we are looking for daily sustenance. And our focus is maybe sometimes on employer, sometimes on a job. And we are looking for those daily things. And our focus just is in that bowl and begging. And a whole life revolves around that, constantly. And yes, we can live a whole life and spend a whole life begging, focus on that bowl, focus on people, focus on employer, and focus on donations and focus on that. But what we really need is sight. 
what we really need is sight. We focus on the little things and forget the big picture. This man was tired. He said, you know, I've been begging. My focus has been on this bowl, on people for such a long time. I now realize I need something big in my life. And only Jesus can do that. Only Jesus can do that. So he didn't care. He didn't care when people rebuked him, when people asked him to shut up. He said, no, I need God to do something in my life. Finally realized, you can be blind all your life, live with that bowl, or I can have my sight, be independent, enjoy life, and understand and experience that all that God wants me to experience. Seize the opportunity, number one. God gives us opportunities. God gives you a chance. God says, do this. You know, go this Sunday with Brother Lionel and bless that person. Or says, teach that Sunday school class. It's sort of those opportunities that he gives. He says, no, I don't need to do that. You postpone. But God gives opportunities. And you need to seize it and say, Lord, I'll be faithful. I will, I will seize that. And then the enemy uses the fear, the, your influence or your family or whatever it is. And you are bombarded with those things. And you need to evaluate whether you want to live the rest of your life looking at that bowl and living in that small little world. Or you want to fulfill the larger plan and purpose of God. And achieve the potential that God has for you. And then the third thing that we find in verse 49. Jesus stopped and said, call him. It's amazing, isn't it? When you call on the Lord, he, st he, he stops to listen uh, to your cry, to your prayer. He stood still. You know, when you call upon the Lord, he hears. Call unto me and I will answer. He says, just call upon me. I will answer. God is so eager to hear us pray. He's so eager. He's eagerly waiting to hear you call him Abba, Father, Daddy. He's just eagerly waiting. And he says, call unto me. And before you call, I will answer. And here we find Jesus stops and then what does he do? Tell he tells the people around, call him. It's a command, by the way. It's in the imperative mood here. Call him. This is a great commission. He could have told Bartimaeus, come. But what does he do? He tells the crowd, he tells the people around to call him. That's the great commission that he has given to us. That's a great commission he has given. He has given us the privilege to call others. He has given us the privilege to call others. Whenever you want to receive something from the Lord, whenever you want to draw close to the Lord, there is always somebody to oppose you. And it could be from your family, it could be your friends, it could be somebody that can influence you tremendously. They will oppose. Just like this person cried out saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. People started rebuking him, scolding him. Stop it. Stop it. But he said, no, I'm not going to succumb to that. I will not be intimidated by people. I will press on. I will... Receive what I need to receive from the Lord. So they called to the blind man. Three things. Notice. Three things that the people say. Number one. What does it say? Cheer up. That's a good news. The Great Commission. We have to announce the good news. And say we have some good news for you. Cheer up. And we need to be excited when we call on people and say you know I have some good news. We are going to have a time of celebration. And number two, up on your feet. Up on your feet. 
Cheer up, rise up. And then he's calling you. Jesus is calling you. Your creator is calling you. Your healer is calling you. He wants to do something in your life. Next verse. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. These people communicate. Communicate saying, I have good news. And I want you to understand that Jesus is calling you. And then how does he respond? He responds by casting away the garment, the outer garment, the overcoat that he was wearing. He casts that away. He rises up, comes to Jesus. Then amazingly, verse 51, Jesus asks, what do you want me to do for you? That's something, isn't it? Jesus knows what he needs. What does he need? He needs sight. He needs sight. But Jesus is asking him a question. Jesus is not asking Bartimaeus for more information. Jesus knows what he needs. But Jesus was asking this question so that Bartimaeus himself will come to a realization of what this need is and confess that with his own mouth and say, Lord, I need sight. What do you want me to do for you? He waits till we ask. He wants us to come to a place where we will confess our need, not only our need, but also confess him as Lord of our lives. He addresses him as rabbi. Another context we find, he addresses him as Lord. He says, great teacher, great master. I want to see. I want to see. God knows what you need, but he waits till you ask him. He waits till you ask him. God knows that you are spiritually blind. God knows what your handicap is. But he still waits for us to ask him. He still waits for us to confess our need. Say, Lord, I messed up. I messed up. I repent. I'll make a U-turn. I confess that I'm a sinner. I confess that I'm in need of your help. This is my need. I confess it with my mouth. What do you want me to do for you? I want to see. John said in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We have to confess our need. We believe in our hearts, confess with our mouth that he is Lord, that we are in need of his help. When we come to that place of confession, he will help us. And he says, I want to see. He makes his announcement. He makes his... He makes his declaration. Lord, what I need is I need sight. I need sight. And Jesus said, verse 52, Go, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. Six times Jesus said, according to your faith, so be it unto you. Not once, not twice, not three times. John Calvin, the great expositor, said, if something is mentioned three times in the Bible, you can make a doctrine out of it. <laughs> Here it's not once, not twice, not three times, but six times Jesus said, your faith has made you whole. There is an element of faith in us experiencing blessings and miracles from God. God is sovereign. He can do whatever he wants. But he waits till we ask and exercise faith. And here Jesus says, your faith has made you whole. And he said this six different times in six different contexts in the Gospels. How are you exercising your faith? You have to exercise your faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And whatever God does in our life, he does it through the avenue of faith. That is why Paul said, whatever is not of faith is sin. So we have to come in faith. We have to believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That he exists. That he is more real than this table that I can feel. Something that is tangible. He's more real than what I can sense or feel or see. And I need to believe that he exists. He exists. And that when I call upon him, he will answer. And he will reward me if I seek him diligently. Diligently. 
you have to exercise faith. Go, Jesus said, your faith has healed you. And what happens? Immediately he received his sight. And the amazing thing is, the next thing that we find is, what, what is he doing? He follows Jesus along the road. What was he doing before? He was sitting, wasn't he? He was sitting, he rises up, goes to Jesus. And then after he received sight, he didn't go back to where he was. He follows Jesus. The reason why God blesses us, the reason why he does miracles, the reason why he wants to bless us is so that we follow him. That we follow him. He was a son of an honorable person. I'm sure he came from a good family. He could have gone back to his family, but he followed Jesus. He followed Jesus. The lessons for us from this passage, God gives to each one of us an opportunity. Are you seizing the opportunity that God gives? And you need to seize it from the front, but once it is gone, All that you can do is just wipe that blonde hair, bald head. It's gone. So you need to pray, Lord, help me to seize every opportunity. Use every opportunity that you give to me. Make that decision today. Lord, I will seize every opportunity. The second decision I want you to make today is that you will not yield to fear or you will not yield to peer pressure. Others were saying, rebuked him, warned him, be quiet, be quiet. Yeah, it's no time for you. No, I want to catch his attention. All the more he shouts and screams and cries, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He would not be intimidated by people. Don't be intimidated. Dial those numbers call. Maybe it's the fifth call or the tenth call where that person will say, yes, I will come. Don't give up. Then be, be authentic and say, Lord, I'm blind. I cannot see. I really need a miracle. I really need a miracle. I want to see. And then once he says, what do you want me to do? And you confess your need. By faith, you need to receive it. He received his sight and it was immediate. It was immediate, but he received it by faith. But Jesus said, go your way. He was still blind. But as he made that step and obeyed the Lord is when he received his sight. Obedience will result in blessings. As he went, Jesus said, go. Jesus didn't say, I'm going to open your eyes. He didn't say that. He said, go. Your faith has made you whole. And as he went, he received his sight. So be obedient to what the Lord tells you to do. And you will receive blessings. And then when he does, follow Jesus. Word of God speak. Would you pour down like rain? Washing my eyes to see your majesty To be still and know that you're in this place Please let me stay and rest in your holiness Word of God speak